I'm James R. Smith, and I served as pastor at Liberty Baptist Church October 1967 through October 1979. I'm Danny Cochran, and I had the privilege of serving as pastor of a Liberty Baptist Church from June 1985 until uh, February of 2000. I'm Joel Sutherland. I served as pastor at Liberty from October 2001 until January 2011. My name is Brian Branham, and I've been the pastor of Liberty Baptist Church since 2012. The people that's, that Liberty are workers. As the Bible says in the book of Nehemiah, the people had a mind to work. When we started out in, in the old church, uh, the first thing that we did the kids were real fretful in the Sunday school rooms, and it was bad out there. And uh, nearly too hot to preach sometimes. And didn't have no air conditioning in that little building. So that's the first thing we did that, that uh, the church did. To, uh, I mentioned it to the deacons and all that. They said, yeah, we, we need to do this. But Liberty Church, so always the, 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 the church in general, they always uh, like to move forward. The Liberty was a bright spot in the community. Bible school, we had day school. Well, one thing we did, we. The church bought a bus, no use bus, school bus. And we did that, we, and Bible school, we picked them up, uh, you know. I remember vacation Bible schools. I, I, we, I'd always been a part of good vacation Bible schools, but something happened at Liberty's Bible schools there. And I used to, called Vacation Bible School Controlled Chaos. And at Liberty, I dropped the word control at it. We were not in control of anything during these Bible schools as we were just putting hundreds and hundreds. I and mean, it was so wild, it hurt. People would have to leave the building because it was so loud and so much they couldn't take it. But I remember I preached the family night back then, the Thursday night, and we'd have kids trickling, getting saved. And I remember I preached that first Thursday night we saw a hundred kids walk down the aisle. Now we, uh, uh, that uh, we had a good revival. I baptized a bunch of them down there in the river, and uh, and it, whenever the evangelists left, why the revival went on. I, I I got revived even. Oh, that, that was. A lot of people were saved and, uh, and some rededications. And, uh, just seemed like all they had to do is somebody invite somebody and I, we just had, we, had, we just went to old fashioned meeting, you know. Uh, we, our revival just went, went on and I baptized about the same amount again, a, a, a river full of them. I would say Liberty has always been a place for the broken in this community. I, I have heard a story several times that back in the 80s, uh, there was a man who was diagnosed with AIDS. And if you were living during that time, that was kind of a taboo word. And if anybody heard of someone who had AIDS, they, they didn't know where, whether you can be in a room with that person, can you touch that person, can you be around And that it person? was during that time that a, a man came to one of our uh, four during one of our revival meetings and uh, he prayed to receive Christ and then he said he needed to talk with me and he kept saying that I have a problem, I have a problem. I went to his home and he told me what uh, the problem was. I told him I can't t promise what the church will do, but I'll support you in any way that I can. He told me that he had been turned away from one church in the area. And so I knew that that was going to be a very challenging transition to make. And so as uh, I began speaking with the leadership, 
And then there came the Sunday that he was going to uh, become a part of the Liberty Baptist Church and I would present him for baptism. And after I presented him and I told the people that if uh, you're not comfortable coming and personally greeting them, uh, they understand. And I think the, the dynamic, the most outstanding moment in my years at Liberty Church was when I didn't know people were going to walk out or what they were going to do, but I knew what I had to do. And those people lined up all the way down the aisle and around the back to greet them. And that was a defining moment in my ministry and I think in the life of Liberty Baptist Church. Not going to be a social club with the religious overtones, but going to be the church of Jesus Christ in our In world. the river and baptize that man. And I, you know, I think that is, that is a moment that has always shown the heart of this church. And now it, that's manifested in Celebrate Recovery. You know, on any given Thursday night, we have 150 to 200 people in this room who who are coming from all sorts of broken places and the Lord is doing this marvelous work of rescuing people in their brokenness. We kept growing until they said, well, we need to begin a new church. And that's when we built the new church. Uh, we did a major, the building, what uh, uh, the, the, we call the Christian Life Center, or the, uh, there we made that building, so we doubled, basically doubled the building size during that time. And so it was probably about 2004, 2005, uh, we put together what we called the Dream Team. Uh, which was about 10 people in the church. I remember the Tim Osmus, Wanda Hill, people like that of the world served on that dream team. And they really studied because we were growing. And, uh, but man, they put their heart and soul into that, figuring out what do we want to do so Liberty can take uh, the next step forward. It was the Sunday before we voted to relocate. I preached a sermon called Keep the Fire Burning. And Joe Langer, who was the elder statesman in our church, was a deacon. He was sitting right over here to my right. And um, his, I guess, great-grandson had gotten saved just a few Sundays before. And in that sermon, uh, I got teary-eyed and I brought his great-grandson up in front of me while I was preaching. And I said, the reason we want to keep the fire burning is because Joe has kept it burning for his great-grandson. And we want him to be able to keep it burning for the next generation. I looked at the church, everybody's in tears, not because of what I was saying, but because they got it. For me, Ever Forward began on day one. Uh, the house was packed. There were so many people that were there. It was at the old Tibbs Bridge Road campus. The, the place where we currently are was just a hole in the ground. And and then my conversations meeting with the leadership before I became the pastor of the church, they had that vision that we want to move and they had already kind of started the process, but there was still a long way to go. And, and so we just kind of stated it on that first day. Um, if, if you vote me to be the pastor of this church, we're moving. And we just kind of set our aim on, on that one thing right there. And, and it was, um, it was really a remarkable process because as we began to pray about it and and to just seek the Lord and how He wanted us to do it, He gave us other things along the way. That's when the, the Liberty Fort Oglethorpe campus, it was a, a campus that was just given to us, a church that had declined and was about to close. Uh, we started Liberty Fort Oglethorpe now, which is now Hope Church Catoosa. And, and so that was a magnificent story. Liberty Spring Place became a part of that story. It was just a an empty lot uh, in a trailer park. And, and it was while we were praying to get here that the Lord began to give us other things. And I think that's always been the story of Liberty, never been content not only to be where it is, but also when it is. The, the community is always changing. Things are, are in people's lives, their needs. And, and the church has always been adjusting to what they see going on around them taking that good news of the gospel, not only to what we talk about going on in here, but also uh, into the community. The, the church has always been one that's looking forward to see what God's going to do next. And always remember 
that he said, Occupy until I come. There is no place to quit until Jesus comes again.